Thank you everybody for coming out to our last summer session. Uh, we got another good event scheduled here for tonight. Starting us off, we're going to be doing another news roundup. This one, however, is going to be kind of a hybrid between usual news roundup as well as a discussion segment at the end to try to get you guys involved. Following that up, we're going to be having a segment dedicated to forensics, which I find is a pretty cool field of cybersecurity. Hopefully you guys feel the same way. Then after a break, we'll be joined by Matthew, a grad of the ISS program, and he'll be giving us a, a rundown, introduction, if you will, to the incident response process. So uh, get ready, get comfortable. We've got a good event scheduled for tonight. Now, before we get started, though, I did promise there would be a big announcement. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, ISS Sessions is back on campus September 15th. So it's been a while, and by a while, I mean, I haven't even been to an in-person ISS Sessions session. In fact, most of the team hasn't either. But uh, this September, we're going to be hosting one. Uh, September 15th, same time as usual. It's a Thursday. Getting started at 7 p.m. in room J102. Uh, there will be more announcements coming once there's more things to announce. Uh, there will be still an online option if you are unable to make it to campus, so don't worry about being left out. That said, I hope to see a lot of you guys out there for the first in-person session in quite a while. But for now, we're going to be here, and I think we got a pretty good event. So let's get started with our news round. Hello, everyone. Today's first story involves Apple products. So the iOS can stop VPNs from working as expected and expose your data. Security researcher Michael Horowitz says that VPNs are broken on iOS. VPNs seem to work at first in the sense that they give a new IP address, DNS, and tunnel for traffic, but they do not terminate previously opened sessions and connections established prior to activating the VPN. This means that some data is being sent outside of the VPN tunnel, and this is known as a data leak. Typically, a VPN shuts existing connections and opens them within the tunnel, but in this case, it does not happen on iOS devices. An iOS VPN bypass vulnerability was reported since update 13.3.1, which was released on January 28th of 2020. Horowitz has reached out to Apple for comments, which is soon to come. Hey everyone, so for my article, it's going to be in regards to uh, critical flaws on widely used Cisco firewalls uh, that were left actually unpatched for many months. <clears throat> so researchers from Rapid7 discovered 10 vulnerabilities in Cisco firewall and network security products. Security experts reported these flaws back in February. However, Cisco has not fixed them to this day. Vulnerabilities were found in Cisco Adaptive Security Software, or ASA for short, ASDM, and Firepower Services Software for ASA. Most of the most of the vulnerabilities allow attackers to execute arbitrary code on administrative systems connected connecting to ASA, and some execute code on a virtual machine hosted on the ASA dash X with Firepower System. So. What will this do? What this will do is turn the system into a Trojan horse. Cisco said it, it is aware of the vulnerabilities and is tracking the vulnerabilities with three advisories and three software bug release notes. Jake Baines, lead security researcher at Rapid7, states that the vulnerabilities have likely been unpatched for years and customers appear not to be updating their ASDM updates on their ASA. When Rapid7 scanned the internet for ASA using ASDM, the most popular version being used was originally released in 2017. Next, please. Hey guys, so for this news article, we're going to be talking about ransomware and how it's kind of evolving. 
Um, so the specific ransomware is called Zeppelin. It's a variant of a Delphi-based ransomware, which are both parts of a ransomware as a service family ransomware. Um, so threat actors are known to use Zeppelin and other ransomware service to target particularly important industries such as healthcare and other critical infrastructure organizations. Once threat actors gain access to a network, they can spend one to two weeks mapping cloud storage and network backups before deploying the ransomware as a dynamic library or an executable. And so this news article came out because there's been an uptick of incidents involving Zeppelin ransomware and the encryption technique has evolved in the more recent attacks. Zeppelin ransomware is now using multiple encryptions on the affected system, which results in the victim needing multiple decryption keys to decrypt their system. As usual with malware, the threat actors will leave a note on the system requesting payment in Bitcoin for their system to be decrypted, which often needs to be paid out as the information that is being encrypted is sensitive information. Next slide. This is, this is my slide, and this pretty much shows uh, how a Chinese VPN got 5.7 billion data entries. So free or, uh, free or freeware VPNs are common in Asia and the Middle East, especially in nations like China and Russia, where internet usage is highly regulated in contrast to Western countries. Therefore, the research team's revelation that the airplane accuracy app's private network service may not be entirely private and may disturb users. On July 7th, a cyber news researcher performed a null checkup utilizing open source intelligence techniques and stumbled onto an open Elasticsearch instance storing 6 626 gigabytes of VPN connection data, a database with 5.7 billion items, including users' ID, their IP address, and connecting from and to domain names, timestamps, was the result of this find. Additionally, throughout the claiming to be a free VPN service, software uses the less secure HTTPS protocol. According to Nick, Depending on how they implement it, it could be that the app could only encrypt web traffic, not traffic from operating systems or other apps. Even through antivirus software, it does not identify this program as harmful, or the research of the raises some serious concerns. According to Cyber News, the airplane app asked for an unusually high amount of rights, including access to the camera, audio recordings, the ability to read and edit contacts, access to external storage, and the ability to install packages. The app request suggests that some of the information it collects was stored in a different database than the one we found, the one that uh, they found. The app in the shop it links to a private policy, however, when clicked on, this was invalid and went to a wrong direction. The lack of transparency appears have been produced by a legal grader where users of the app may not be exposed to their data being shared. Next slide. So here, Novant Health, which is a healthcare system based in South Carolina, emits a leak of 1.3 million patients' info to Facebook, or now known as Meta. So Novant Health, an integrated network of physician clinics, outpatient centers, and hospitals, may have disclosed 1.3 million patients' sensitive data to Meta. This was due to an incorrect configuration of an online tracking tool known as Facebook Pixel, Metapixel, or Just Pixel, which is code that tracks users, users' activity on a website for marketing and analytic purposes meaning that information was collected during form submissions for patients. This means that protected health information was leaked and violated. After this was discovered, Pixel was disabled and investigated, and, and uh, one patient even filed a class action lawsuit stating that Meta had violated the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Hey guys, it's me again. Um, this next article is, we're going to be talking about crazy cybersecurity wizard. His name is uh, Leonard Vouders. And with a $25 homemade circuit board, this guy actually gained access to SpaceX's satellite based internet system. So basically, Vouders gained unauthorized access to the system's network using a voltage fault injection attack on the Starlink user terminal uh, so that's the that's the terminal that's on the ground so basically Vouders took apart the user terminal and attached his homemade circuit board 
and the circuit board comprised of a Raspberry Pi, flash storage, electronic switches, and a voltage regulator. It was all soldered to the existing Starlink circuit board and was connected using a few wires. The circuit board carried out the attack by temporarily shorting the system, which allowed for a bypass of Starlink security protections. The chip runs this glitch only to the read-only memory bootloader and the deployed firmware updates on later bootloaders, which gave him full control of the dish. This gave Vouders root access to the Starlink user terminal and he was able to execute arbitrary code and could freely explore the Starlink network. Starlink has struck great interest in many cybersecurity professionals and threat actors alike to find security holes in this new technology. SpaceX has already responded to this new vulnerability and have openly invited security researchers, security researchers to bring on the bugs as they would like to uncover all potential security bugs with the technology. All right, so now we're going to be getting into the discussion portion of this session segment. So we're going to give a brief rundown on how this will work. So first, a prompt will be read by the host. And now here's the important part. You guys are gonna respond afterwards. And you're gonna start your responses either with exclamation mark yay or exclamation mark nay, depending on whether you agree or not. You can also use the plus sign at the end of your message if you wish to elaborate on mic, because you know sometimes you can't get your point across just by a text. Uh, there's also the replies feature if you wanna to respond to a specific comment so you got a couple examples here exclamation mark yay i agree with that prompt exclamation mark nay i disagree with that prompt any questions feel free to ask but... i'll just uh, pop in here right now since i can see that we're making use of the thread feature i'll just let everyone know is that um, in order to be considered valid you do have to write in stream questions unfortunately threads are a new feature and we have not yet integrated it with the bot good catch christian that's why he's on the team. The only reason. Of course. All right, so uh, without further ado, let's take it away in stream questions. Hey, everyone. So this first discussion story comes from ZDNet and is about a case the cybersecurity company Sophos worked on in which one organization was hit with three different ransomware attacks in the span of a few weeks, first by Lockbit, Hive, and then Black Cat. All three ransomware were able to gain access using the same vulnerability, a compromised remote desktop protocol session on the organization's domain controller. Each form of ransomware moved through the network, encrypting data and dropping their own ransom demands. Some data was triple encrypted, and Lockbit also exfiltrated the data it encrypted. Although it's unclear whether these attacks were coordinated, the last ransomware attack, Black Cat, attempted to clear Windows event logs of not only its own activities, but also the activities of the other two ransomware. Researchers at Sophos note the trend of ransomware cooperating with other ransomware. The opposite is found for other attacks, for example, crypto miners and remote access trojans, which try to terminate rival malware patch vulnerabilities so that other malware can't find its way in. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the prompt is, do you think that there is some benefit to ransomware attackers behaving cooperatively with each other? Okay, I'll just go through some of these answers then. So, yay, teamwork makes the dream work. Uh, okay, great. More money, yar, and then come up with some more elaborate schemes. Okay, thank you, Russell. Appreciate that. Uh, longer downtime, possibly? Uh, that would be... Yeah, I guess there are different ways people can interpret this, like whether it's good for them or good for, like, other people. Like the defense, actual defenders. So, what is this, a crossover episode? Uh, nay, because it's easier to catch. Yeah, I can see that. Like, uh, if there's more general noise on a system, then they may be able to find all three when they might not find a single one. Uh, and I said, good for them, maybe, but back to the companies and defenders. Uh, yay for them. Yeah, it'll probably be better for them if they're working together. Yeah, does anyone else have anything they want to add? One once. One twice. So...
Okay, we got one person type. Okay, we got Spider Man gift. Awesome. Me and the other malware in the system. <clears throat> yeah, sometimes I wonder if they like. I wonder if they like plan these kind of things. Like if they say, okay, well, I'm going to put ransomware here and you're going to do it too. We're all going to do it. Or if it's more like just a coincidence. So yeah. Uh, 62.5 said yay. 37.5 said yay. Now I guess we're on to our next, our next uh, discussion. Okay. So I'm going to read this one. Uh, so Google Cloud Armor customer was hit with a distributed denial of service or DDoS attack on June 1st, targeting the victim's HTTPS load balancer. Initially, with just 10,000 um, RPS, and then in eight minutes it goes to 100,000. Google Cloud Armor protection kicked in based on the data analysis. So in just two minutes after that, the attack escalated to a record-breaking. 46 million, which is the largest ever of its kind, almost 80% more than the previous record, which was uh, 26 million that Cloudfire mitigated in June. So, um, an equivalent of basically getting all daily requests to Wikipedia in just 10 seconds. So, imagine how many people use Wikipedia in a day and how many pages they go through, and that's in just 10 seconds. So the customer deployed the recommended rule from Cloud Armor, allowing operations to run normally, and the assault ended 69 minutes after it started. Uh, cue the nice. Um, leaders presume the attacker likely determined it would not have a desired impact while incurring significant expenses to execute. So they kind of almost waited them out. Like it wasn't doing what they wanted it to do, and they kind of had to cut it off because it was using too, probably too much resources or like that. And so the malware behind the attack has yet to be determined, but the geographic distribution of the services used points to Mary, a botnet responsible for DDoS attacks peaking at 17.2 million RPS and 21.8. Uh, both record breaking at their time. Uh, Google researchers say that attack traffic came from just 5,256 IP addresses uh, spread across 132 countries, which leveraged encrypted requests with HTTPS, indicating that the device sending the requests had rather strong computing resources. So, um, like we could kind of see with them having to stop because it was taking too much, um, they were probably just using a lot of resources for a big attack, and then it Kind of took too long and they were running out because they would need a lot of resources to do this and starting last year an era of record-breaking volumetric ddos attacks uh, which start with a few botnets that leverage a small amount of powerful devices hit various targets with fewer hits so this is kind of just the start with these ddos attacks and they're only going to get better from here and like this one was blocked, but who knows? They might have uh, learned from this and they might do better next time. Okay, next slide. So our prompt, are companies like Google obligated to share the defense techniques and tools with others, such as smaller companies, or even maybe governments, who may not have similar capabilities to protect themselves and their clients? So should we share the wealth with this kind of stuff? Share the knowledge. Several people are typing. You'll love to see it. Yay. Okay. You think they should share? Great. Sharing is caring. That's an interesting point. Security obfuscation is one of the key principles of security. Because that could lead to a potential scenario where if everyone's getting their security ideas from Google, let's say, let's say Google, then, like, once you figure out Google's recipe, you'll know how to ruin it. 
very similar to how Cloudflare shares a postmortem. Yeah, so like when you're attacked, maybe not like the exact strategies you share, but like what happened and how it happened so people can look for similar things. Um, yeah, cloud owners do have a responsibility to protect their customers, including knowledge sharing. I agree with that. Um, so sure, you might be like, oh, my company secret, my secrets, this is how we do it. But I think like your clients should come first. You should be able to communicate with your fellow companies. Um, security, security behind hiding things is not security. I already said they would, but open source. Um, okay. uh, it can still expect it can still affect their customers, but from a different company. Yeah, so from different um, uh, like so pieces of software or things like that. And group immunization, but don't let it be your only solution. That's true. So they should come up with their own things. I'm just gonna turn off my fan. I think it might be a bit of background noise. Okay, uh, unless anyone has anything else to say, I guess we'll move on a bit. Oh, it looks like the title got a little cut out there, but yeah, you guys know the question. Um. Yeah, it seems like it's pretty overwhelmingly 85% yays. Um, and yeah. I feel like I agree with that. And yeah, so we'll move on to our next segment, which is fun with forensics. So, uh, with fun with forensics, we kind of had the idea of we wanted to go into some different um, kind of fields with insecurity and kind of detail them a bit um, and go into a bunch of like what it is, what kind of roles are there, what kind of skills you might need, and some interesting stuff within it, just so we can kind of give people a better idea on what they might be getting into with a certain, um, with a certain field. Okay, so next slide. So we're going to be talking about a bunch of different things. What is digital forensics? What are some of the use cases where digital forensics might be done? Uh, what types of digital forensics are there? What are some common techniques? Um, we're going to detail a bit about investigations, um, some common tools, uh, roles you might fill in this field, uh, certifications you might get or might be useful to get. And lastly, we're going to talk about an interesting case that we found related to forensics. Okay, well, I'm starting with what is digital forensics? So digital forensics is a branch of forensics that involves working with data that is stored digitally. Kind of self-explanatory, digital forensics. And so this includes the identifying, firing, processing, analyzing, and reporting of data that is stored in an electronic form. It can be used to find and stop cybercrime or even within a company to detect cases such as fraud. We're going to talk more about different things like that later. Um, it helps the company or client know exactly what has happened in an incident so they can then um, remediate it and then also protect themselves better so it won't happen again. Because they'll know exactly what happened, exactly what was weak, and they can fix it later. Um, so it involves looking at many different types of information that is on computers or other storage devices, all different types of files and things like that. Okay, next slide. Okay, so we're gonna, I'm gonna go over some use cases quick. I think these are the top, like top four that I found on where a digital forensics team in a company or, or a freelance might be called in. 
So the first one is electronic discovery. So this would be part of any court case um, where there is some kind of electronic element, some kind of, uh, if there's a phone found on the scene of the crime, or if the victim of a murder had their laptop open, or if you see something from a suspect that you seize their cell phone and might have things on that. So it's part of the discovery phase, a legal case that it specifically looks, capture, um, I should have said, and um, sort relevant digital evidence and ensure it's processed correctly. Uh, special measures must be taken to avoid changing evidence in any way to keep it as eligible evidence. Because it's a very uh, fickle process. If um, a lot of the time it's used with hashes, I know. So if the hash changes at all, you like you make a hash of the file you're going to use, and if it changes at all, you're not allowed to use it because who knows what you changed. It's very hard to tell. Unless you can replicate it and show them. But basically, the idea is don't change the evidence because then they'll say you can't use this. Um, also, fraud. So if an employee at a company is suspected as fraud, the company may bring a digital forensic team in to examine their, their devices. Uh, they might look at their emails, their invoices, and any other file that might implicate the employee, especially if the fraudster is kind of smart and they hide this information somehow because then that's what the forensic team will look for and that's their specialty. Um, yeah, so if they see any emails talking about it, any invoices, um, any network traffic that might suggest they're sending money or secrets or anything. Okay, uh, next slide. So the next two I found, uh, the first one is employment disputes. Uh, I'm just gonna start with my dad with this, but I'll, I'll say that at the end. So in cases where sensitive information may have been taken uh, after employees been fired, the devices may be searched to ensure that nothing sensitive has been stored or sent away. Um, my dad had a case with this where they fired someone from his company, like a salesperson, who is in Montreal, and the person didn't give back their company laptop. So he had to go down to Montreal with his boss and basically get the laptop and uh, check emails and stuff like that to make sure nothing was sent off of it or make sure nothing was hidden. I think they might have had a team with it, but I'm not entirely sure. This was a while ago. But yeah, basically, companies have secrets. Uh, you don't want someone who's fired to go bring your secrets to a different company or to not a company, like a criminal organization, especially related to security. So the last part is instant response. So a digital forensic team might be used to investigate a cyber attack to determine the important details of the incident to gain insights on how to stop cyber attacks. So kind of like was said earlier, like a post-mortem report. So after the incident, you make a report and you see what happened, um, where the company might have gone wrong with their defenses, what could be done better. Okay, next slide. Now I'm hitting it off. Yeah, thanks, Jackson. So next we're going to talk about types of digital forensics. Um, as you can see, there's, there's a list of eight here and a brief description, but I'll, I'll go a little bit more in depth on each of them. So first is database forensics. Basically, this is the examination of information contained in databases for potential evidence threat actors. This type of digital forensic often involves the examination of data and its related metadata. Next is email forensics. So email forensics involves recovering and analyzing emails and data associated with email platforms such as schedules and contacts. That one's pretty straightforward. And the next one is malware forensics. With malware forensics, it, it's going to be going through code to identify potential malicious programs and analyzing their payload. Such programs you're going to be looking for are like Trojan horses, malware, spyware, or any other malicious software. And then memory forensics. 
This is also known as live acquisition. This type of digital forensics involves collecting data from the computer's RAM and cache to identify potential evidence of uh, threat actors. Next is mobile forensics. As the name suggests, this form of digital forensics involves the investigation of mobile devices. It involves collecting and analyzing information, including contacts, incoming and outgoing texts, pictures, and videos. Next, network forensics. Uh, much like memory forensics, network forensics involves live acquisition of data. Uh, it involves network traffic monitoring using tools such as firewall, intrusion detection system, or other network monitoring software. Moving on to digital image forensics. Uh, images can often be a source of evidence in invest investigation, but digital images specifically can contain more data than what meets the eye. In digital image forensics, photographs are often analyzed for their metadata and their auth authenticity is validated through this metadata. And for the last one, digital video and audio forensics. Similarly to image forensics, audio and video evidence is important, but metadata is even more important. Audio and video forensics seeks to validate the audio and video sources and determine whether the recording is original or is being tampered with either maliciously or accidentally. Next slide. And I have another list for you guys. Uh, and these are common techniques that uh, digital forensic prof professionals may use when undergoing an investigation. So first one here, we have reverse steganography. And steganography is a common tactic used to hide data inside any type of digital file, message, or data stream. Computer forensic experts reverse a steganography attempt by analyzing the data ha hashing that the file in question contains. If a cyber criminal hides important information inside an image or other digital file, it may look the same before and after to the untrained eye but the underlying hash or string of data that represents the image will change. And next for stochastic forensics, here investigators will analyze and reconstruct digital activity without the use of digital artifacts. Artifacts are unintended alterations of data that occur from digital processes. Artifacts include clues related to a digital crime, such as changes to file attributes during data Stochastic forensics is frequently used in data breach investigations where the attacker is thought to be an insider who might not leave behind digital artifacts. Next, cross-drive analysis. This technique correlates and cross-references information found on multiple computer drives to search for, analyze, and preserve information relevant to the investigation. Events that raise suspicion are compared with information on other drives that look for similarities and provide context. This is also known as anomaly detection. Next, live analysis. With this technique, the computer is out analyzed from within the OS while the computer or device is running using system tools in the computer. The the analysis looks at volatile, volatile data, which is often stored in cache or RAM. Many tools used to extract volatile data require the computer to be in a forensic lab to maintain the legitimacy of a chain of evidence. And finally, we're going to look at deleted file recovery. Um, this technique involves searching a computer system and memory for fragments of files that were partially deleted in one place, but leave traces elsewhere on the machine. This is also sometimes known as file carving or data carving. Next slide. Uh, forensic investigations. So the steps in preparing and executing forensic investigations depend on the nature of the case, but they follow these general steps. Um, the first one is to assess the nature of the case. For example, do you suspect that the device was used to commit a crime? 
or does it have evidence on it about another crime? Step two is to obtain the evidence or the device that the evidence is on, for example, hard drives or removable media like USBs and CDs. There's a specific way of handling evidence, which involves putting it in a secure container that can be locked and protects the evidence from damage. Additionally, a chain of custody needs to be established, which is a record of who recovered the evidence and when, and who else had access to the evidence and when. Um, chain of custody pretty much provides proof that the evidence obtained wasn't tampered with or altered. Step three is to create a copy of the evidence to work on. For example, if you had a hard drive, you would create a forensic image of the whole thing. You could use a tool like FTK Imager for this, which we'll dig into more in the next slide. Step four, analyze, the recover, analyze and recover the digital evidence using the copy you made. This could take a long time of sifting through mass amounts of information if you don't know what you're looking for. Step five, investigate the data you recovered. Here you have to organize all the relevant information that you found to support your case. For example, to prove a suspect's innocence or guilt or to investigate how an attacker got into a network. Once you have enough evidence, the last step is to write a case report of your findings. If this is a criminal case, you might be called on as an expert witness and have to defend your findings at trial. So um, there are numerous of useful tools out there. Uh, however, these are the top five forensic tools you should get familiar with if you're planning to specialize in the digital forensic breach. So the first one is ProDiscovery. So uh, ProDiscovery uh, is a uh, forensic tool used for computer security that enables uh, computer professionals to locate all the data on a computer disk and at the same time protects evidence and creates quality evidentiary reports uh, for use in legal proceedings. ProDiscovery uh, Forensic allows the examination of files without altering valuable metadata, uh, such as last time access, and can recover deleted files, examine Slack space, access Windows alternate data streams, dynamically allow a preview, uh, searching, for example, like regex uh, can be used, and image capture of hardware protected area of the disk. <clears throat> the second uh, tool is called SleuthKit. Uh, so SleuthKit is a library and collection of command line tools uh, that allows you to investigate disk images. So the core functionality allows you to analyze volume and file system data. The library can, can be incorporated into larger digital forensic tools and the command line tools can be directly used to find evidence. It can also analyze raw, for example, DD files, uh, expert witness files, AFF file system, and disk images. SleuthKit enables you to extract data from call logs, SMS, and contacts. <clears throat> the third one is called NCASE, and NCASE is mainly used for court case scenarios for finding, decrypting, collecting, and preserving forensic data from a wide variety of devices while ensuring evidence integrity and seamlessly integrating investigation workflows. NCASE also allows the investigator to conduct in-depth analysis of user files to collect evidence such as documents, pictures, internet history, and window registry information. The fourth tool is called SIFT. So SIFT is a computer forensic distribution that installs all necessary tools on Ubuntu to perform a detailed digital forensic and an incident response examination. Uh, some of the pre-installed softwares include, but not limited to, SleuthKit, uh, which is a file system analysis tool, as uh, stated earlier, uh, Plasto, and Log2 Timeline, uh, timeline generation tool, uh, SSDeep and uh, MD5Deep, uh, those are hashing tools, Foremost and Scalp, those are file carving, uh, Wildshark, uh, Network Forensics, uh, Volatile, Volatility Framework, uh, memory analysis tool, autopsy, a GUI front end for SleuthKit. It is cross compatibility between Windows and Linux and supports multiple uh, file systems such as MS-DOS, FAT, VFAT, NTFS for Windows and HFS for Mac and UFS for Solaris. And finally, the last one is Forensics Toolkit or FTK for short. So it is a computer forensic software that basically scans a hard drive looking for various information 
uh, such as locating deleted emails, scan a disk for text strings, and then uh, use it as a password dictionary to crack encryption, parse reg registry files, locate, manage, and uh, filter mobile data, and finally, collect and process and analyze data sets containing, contained in Apple file systems. Uh, FTK Imager is a data previewing and imaging tool that uh, lets you quickly access electronic evidence to determine if further analysis with forensic tools such as Forensic Toolkit is needed. And FTK Imager is also part of uh, Forensic Toolkit. I'll be discussing the, the roles of uh, digital forensics, like what companies might need it and what are some future career opportunities. Almost all companies need digital forensics, like a digital forensics team. To list a few primary companies they might know of is like Mandiant, Shopify, and Deloitte. And most banks also need it too, to protect their data from attackers and resolve and prevent attacks to concur. To list a few digital forensic roles or like careers, which is like forensic computer analysis, which assists in investigations of crimes and cybersecurity incidents information security analysis to protect a company's computer network and servers, and malware analysis to examine, identify, and understand the natures of viruses, worms, bots, and Trojan horses. This was all brought up in types of digital forensics. Uh, these are the top three that I found that, uh, that most people go into, and uh, more often uh, to increase in your job. Okay, that's the next slide. <laughs> and now we're on to certifications. Uh, sorry, previous slide. So when it comes to certifications within the industry, it's always best to select certifications that are in demand. So this means that when you're applying for a job, you actually want to read the job posting first. And under the requirements section, there should usually be um, certain certification requirements that the job or role requires or needs. So if you're looking for a specific type of work, you'll need some specific certs, as mentioned. But if you're just starting out your career, you may want to get like a beginner or entry level certification like a CompTIA. Um, nowadays, it's also important to have a well and good understanding of cloud services. Um, there are cloud certifications out there from uh, Microsoft, Google, and uh, Amazon. But uh, sometimes specific certs may not be necessary. So if you're looking for a job, um, it may not even be required to have a certification. Uh, certifications are expensive. And if you are hired by a company and you're working full time, maybe one of the benefits that you may have at your company will be that they'll be able to subsidize your training and provide you the cert. Next slide. So this is, a, this is actually a website which has like most or if not all of the cybersecurity related certifications. It looks complicated. Uh, there's a lot of acronyms, but if you go to the website, you can actually hover over each individual box and it'll give you the, the full name of the certification as well as its estimated cost in US dollars. Um, if you look towards the right, I have in a yellow box highlighted the, the um, specific certifications for digital forensics. But uh, you won't necessarily need only a certification in just digital forensics. Uh, you could have certifications in the other areas of this map as well. Next slide. So I went through some job postings on Glassdoor and Indeed, and I just searched by a keyword digital forensics. So any role that requires any use of uh, digital forensic practices. And I'd say about half of them, maybe a third, actually listed their requirements for uh, what sort of certification that you may need. And most of the senior management positions actually require a CISSP, which stands for Certified Information Systems Security Professional. Uh, so like if you're going into senior, becoming a senior in your, in your role or going to management, this is the certification that you'll get and you'll see this a lot. Um, there's also requirements for uh, you know, cloud certifications. Um, a popular one, uh, popular company or entity that actually gives certifications is actually GIAC. So GIAC, they have a lot of certifications for very specific roles. Um, one of the certifications that they have is GIAC Certified Forensic Analysis or Analyst, which is what our speaker actually has for today. Um, if you remember from our June speaking, or, or our June speaker, he had a certification for C-Risk, 
which was for risk management. And the point is just to highlight the fact that at some point in your career, uh, you'll need a certification as you go or as you become more developed and more, um, I guess, towards later in your career. But I have heard some people who have started their careers off with just the CompTIA Security Plus or even not even having a certification at all. Um, so it's also good to you know check the websites directly instead of going on job boards as well. So if you go to like let's say like like Riot Games careers or like Blizzard, uh, if you look at their security positions, they also list their requirements for um, for certifications as well. So it's always good to stay up to date on what's in demand in the industry, and you should plan around that. Next slide. Okay, so now I'm just going to touch on an interesting case in forensics uh, quickly. Um, Singh uh, found this one, but he is not here today, so I'm going to it. So this one is about um, a hack that targeted Cisco, where a ransomware gang claimed it has 2.8 gigabytes of data. So on May 24th, so a few months ago now, the Yan Luo Wang ransomware group published a partial list of files it claims to have exfiltrated from Cisco the same day its Talos intelligence group confirmed it had been hacked. So basically, it made a list and it said, we have these files. We took them. Um, and so it was confirmed by the Cisco uh, Security Incident Response Team, or CSERT, uh, that it was confirmed as a network breach following further investigation. And so uh, one of the big things with these is who is behind the attack or the hack. So the initial access vector successfully fished an employee's personal Google account, leading to a compromise of their credentials and access to the Cisco VPN, which basically gave them a tunnel in. Um, so this hack was tied to the Russian group UNS UNC2447, and the Yan Luo Wang, I think I'm pronouncing that right, ransomware gang, thought to be based out of Brazil. The group was ejected from the network, prevented from re entry despite many attempts over the following weeks. Um, so, Cisco confirmed the tactics, techniques, and procedures, or TTPs, by UNC 2447, uh, which also showed some uh, overlap with the Lapsus group, many of whom were arrested earlier in the year. So, like we said before, usually it's good to share what happened, even if it's embarrassing, so other people can prepare better. Okay, next slide. So, from a threat intelligence analyst perspective, uh, so while the data exfiltrated are not greater or are not of great importance or sensitivity, sometimes threat actors uh, uh, seek to gain mainstream publicity. And underground cred, which can lead to further resources and collaboration. So it's not necessarily every time they're going for the gold. Sometimes they're just going for something that'll boost them up, so they can get famous, and then people might want to join them or help them out, or they might be able to partner with other gangs, and then get to the big things, and go for the big bucks. So um, IABs act as contractors, auctioning their access to corporate networks on popular dark web hacking. So Kaspersky has developed a free Yen Luo Wang ransomware decryptor tool. If you get hit by the same ransomware that they typically use, you can just decrypt it. No harm to your company, as long as you can't decrypt it. Uh, so it uncovered a vulnerability within the RSA 1024 algorithm of the malware, uh, which they then use to crack encryption. So a as long as the victim has one or two unencrypted files, the ransomware decryption tool should work. <clears throat> However, Cisco says that there was no ransomware deployment during the attack that it could find. Uh, so they said Cisco did not identify any impact to our business as a result of this incident, including no impact to any Cisco products or services, uh, sensitive customer data, or sensitive employee information. Cisco intellectual property or supply chain operations. Um, yeah, so they don't, they 
basically are saying that there was very little impact. Um, on August 10th, the bad actors publish a list of files from the security incident to the dark web. And so this statement was heard by CSERP. So they basically, they basically said, okay, there's no impact to us. But then the attackers released that they published files, that, that they had taken files. So it wasn't necessarily a disruption attack, it was a stealing attack. So a company-wide password reset was initiated right after the breach and is to be praised for a clear and detailed disclosure that it has made regarding the technicalities of the hack. Okay. And yeah, that's it for our fun with forensics. Um, yeah, so next we will be having a break and then we're going to have our amazing speaker. Hope you all enjoy. Hope you learn something. And I guess next yeah. time we'll do this will be awesome. Yeah, thank you, content team. Um, the CCR code is on screen. I'll be posting the CCR uh, form in chat in just a second. Well, we'll get started at, I guess, say 8 o'clock. And we'll be joined by Matthew talking about the incident response process. So stick around. All right, thank you, everybody. Hope you enjoyed your break. Uh, we're here with Matthew, a graduate of the program. And I don't want to take too much away from uh, his talk. So Matthew, feel free to take it away. Hey, thank you. Uh, before I start, I just have a quick question. Was the, the fun with forensics thing uh, pre-planned, or was it just a coincidence? Uh, it was a coincidence. It was actually just a coincidence. Oh, damn, really? That's really cool, then. Anyways, I'm ready to go. Thank you all for coming. My name is Matthew Shuda. I'm an associate consultant at Mandiant, and this is an introduction to the incident response process. So I'm going to talk about why an incident response process. Why should we have an incident response process? We're going to talk about identifying an incident. So from an internal perspective, what is considered an incident? We'll be responding to an incident, what should be done when an incident occurs and what is important to do, post-incident, and what happens after. And afterwards, we can do question and answers if we have time. I can answer any questions you may have. You may see after the process or anything else. So about me, uh, I graduated in 2019. Uh, my interests, I like Magic the Gathering. I read Keep Up with Manga. I've been reading to Kaizen lately. Uh, play I'm playing Destiny 2 right now, and I should also try to balance up my lifestyle by doing some other outdoor activities like kayaking. And whenever I'm working in Toronto, I always like to try different food spots. My first position out of school was as a was in security operations or as a security analyst, where my job was basically to uh, respond to, to incidents from an internal perspective. And then after that, I pivoted into a uh, consulting field. I started my position at Main Hint beginning of 2021, but I've actually been doing forensics for two and a half years. Oh, and I also have a dog named Magnus, who's a Shih Tzu. Very cute. So, why should we have an IR process? Number one, you get validated playbooks, which are specifically outlined processes and procedures and what to do. Create a war room, send notifications, let legal know, etc. etc. Uh, et you have to make sure that this is specific to the organization. There's also accountability. So specific teams during an incident have certain responsibilities that are already outlined prior. You can't really hold people accountable if you don't say that they had the responsibility in the first place. If you like were asking for network logs from the network team and they weren't told that this was their obligation to do so, then you can't really blame them for it. You have to make sure it's like outlined and it's agreed upon. And then there's a term we like to use in uh, incident response called missing the mark. So when you're dealing with an active threat actor, if the remediation is done too quickly, it can tip off the attacker and cause them to act hastily and change their tactics, techniques, and procedures. So basically, we want to make sure we we do it right the first time so they don't know what's happening. So we want them to be kicked out the first time. You also want to include legal in this. So if it's an incident that will cause bad PR or legal problems, you want to make sure the procedures are outlined correctly and internal legal and existing contractual obligations have been considered in this process. And finally, IT considerations. You have to outline like the specific tools need to be used, such as break glass accounts, or maybe password vaults need to be used. 
and other environmental considerations such as uptime and maintenance periods. So let's talk about identifying an incident. Let's start with, so you guys might remember CIA from uh, some of your classes. Second and third years might remember this, but I'll explain this for those who don't. Confidentiality is where data is accessible to unauthorized parties. So an example of this would be like the threat actor was able to access more data. Integrity is where the original data has been tampered with. A good example of this would be like if data was hit with a big ransomware or has been changed, like maybe they changed a one to a zero in the document. Maybe they added an extra zero to their bank account. And accessibility, where the data is inaccessible. For example, the distributed denial, distributed denial of service attack prevents customers from accessing services. Next, we'll talk about failure bypass of controls. So for example, a lot of systems in corporate environments will have monitoring tools on systems and a bypass or failure would be like if uh, the tools were bypassed or they were turned off. We wouldn't want to know those happen. And we have rule triggers. So SIMs and SOCs, they often categorize certain events as an incident if they meet a criteria role. Maybe they'll say like, oh, this is a base 64 event. And then anomalous activity. So this is a relatively newer feature of some SIMs and SOCs where they basically baseline the activity of the environment. And whenever they see something unusual, it'll trigger an alert. Now, one thing I want to kind of highlight is this is a common mistake with a lot of uh, new individuals into the incident response field, that not all incidents are breaches. Using the word breach has a very, very specific connotation associated with it. So if you are using it, you have to, when you're talking to a boss or a client, you must understand the significance of what you are saying. So for the definition of a breach, we call it a data breach, is where the controls have failed, resulting in sensitive data being divulged to unauthorized parties. And this can happen intentionally or unintentionally. You don't want to call everything a breach because like you are basically trying to avoid the situation where, you know, the boy who cried wolf. If you keep saying everything is a breach, people are not going to take you seriously. So basically you only want to say when it's actually like shit has figuratively hit the fan. Next we'll talk about start applying to an incident. So the first thing you need to do is scope the incident. You need to determine what systems are affected. You need whatever tools in your process to determine which systems are affected. Next, you need to identify indicators of compromise. You need to check the alert that was given to you and then examine the affected systems for additional IOCs. Typically, when you get an alert, you're only gonna get like the one major event, but this usually comes in with other sources of activity as well. And then when you have all those IOCs, you want to scan the environment. Use the ICs that you have gathered during your investigation and remediation plan to determine if the incident has escaped the scope. Because you essentially want to make sure that this has been contained, one, not having more systems that have not been detected as part of this. Next is you want to create a plan to remediate. As, as we discussed before, there's the term miss the mark, which could cause more problems. If the attacker is tipped off that you are trying to kick them out, they might like maybe had in their plan. Maybe they were like, okay, we were going to you know, ransomware the environment in on the 10th, but we're going to go do it now because we only have so much time before they kick us out. So essentially you want to do it in one big swoop. And then we want to remediate. So one example of a remediation plan that we offer to clients would be like creating a green VLAN, which is where we isolate all the systems. And then for each system that we have analyzed individually, we whitelist them and then they get added to the the green VLAN, which has access to the internet. So we basically like, you know, making like checking their vaccination status. I guess if I want to use that as an analogy, making sure that they have the proper credentials before they're allowed to have internet access again. And yeah, and again, the remediation, ideally all remediation is done in a quick action to reduce chance of, a, of the attacker being able to stay in the network. So now let's go talk about the internal response process from the in-house perspective. So from internal response, I will divide these into two categories, internal notification and external notification. So in internal notification, we have the SIM, security information event management, SOC, uh, security operations center. Basically, they, they are your internal tools that will let you know from an internal perspective, you've been, something is going on. Or you might see signs of CIA compromise, like maybe your website is no longer working or you notice some data has been like encrypted or something like that. So that's how you know from an internal perspective something has gone wrong. But then we also have external notification. So this is not relatively new, but it's, a, it's an interesting perspective. So for example, victim notification, a lot of organi some organizations, especially like reputable uh, security organizations, they will actually 
scour the dark web or other sources of information for signs that you know maybe attackers trying to sell access to a specific company's net network they'll look to the dark web for like that kind of advertisement and then they will let the victims know hey we saw this on that you know you might have a uh, attacker in your network so that would be a victim notification and that's actually one of the things that Manion does. We use the information that we've gathered from like these multiple sources to help these organizations. We let them know. We don't charge for it. We just basically like reach out to them, saying like, "Hey, this want to use us as uh, as your instant response provider? Sure, but we just wanted to let you know like you might have something in your uh, environment that needs to be taken care of." Next, we have government agencies. So this is actually interesting in itself. For example, the FBI could tip off a big organization, like for example. I like maybe oil company can be tipped out by a government agency saying that oh we saw some attackers and you know governments have invested interest in uh, their infrastructure so they would obviously break their silence to talk to these companies and then there's threat actor notices so like if you are a CEO and you wake up one morning and then you check your phone and be like you got a Twitter message from or a Twitter post saying that you have been hacked that would be considered an external notification because like you didn't know anything internally that something was happening, but now you have you're being notified across. There. So when you're starting internet, you have to be able to triage it. So ninety nine percent of all alerts you get from a sim or a SOC would be false positive. And that's why they need to be tuned. They rarely work outside of the box. So for con for company specific intricacies, this is actually one of the challenges of being like a new person in the field or being a consultant is because we don't have the home turf knowledge. We don't know like the company specific behaviors like, oh, we know that they use uh, this old version of SSL for a very legitimate reason or maybe the expected behavior. Like we know that they use base 64 encoded PowerShell to deploy their deployment software. And there's also such a thing as false positive where the event, if it was successful is bad, but it's actually a failed attempt because the server was actually patched, like a web app with like a web-based exploit on a web server was hatched, but the they didn't have a WAF to actually like event destination. When it comes to determining the priority, you have a small incident versus a large breach. You have to basically prioritize accordingly based off what the actual event is. Is this like a failed attempt that happened to one system? Or are we talking about like signs of ransomware that have affected the entire environment? You need to determine what the priority is based off the, this, uh, this activity. Uh, your SIM or your SOC may actually give you a priority out of the box. These tools have existing priorities for different signatures and can be overridden with different priorities for company-specific intricacies. And then type of activity. And this kind of goes back to the, the small versus large topic, but you have to actually see what the activity is, and it could be a false positive activity or you know, a serious threat action activity. So when you're working in internal inter 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 uh, internal response, you have to work with other teams. And depending on the organization, it's different between organizations. You, know, you have different teams, you have different processes. This process should be documented. At, at least with the organizations I've worked for, they often use the principle of least privilege, where, you know, for example, the incident response team might have might have might not have permission to do certain things, and that requires them to, you know use break glass accounts in order to access. There's also the concept of war room, which is a way for quicker communication of information between different teams. And then there's also the responsibility of information sharing. So like informing your own organization internally about an incident. For example, hey, our Confluence server is down due to an incident. Uh, it's been one hour since we... So if you ever worked for like a company and you've seen like those like internal notifications like for days or something like that, kind of like the similar concept. And then know your difference between technical and management meetings. So you need to know your audience. Keep only the necessary information to relevant parties. Networking should, you know, should like for example, networking should only know about what like IP ranges are affected and not like, oh, we've been breached. So keep like, you know, keep like the nitty gritty stuff to the specific teams. So when you respond to the incident, gather the information about the incident and execute your remission plan and similar to the previous steps in the previous slide. And then when it comes to post-incident, we have validation. We want to validate there's no more activity from the incident. This is very important. We want to make sure that we did our job properly. Then there's report creation. Creating a report is an, is an important document for informing offer management. And it actually may be required to give that information to 
uh, governing bodies with legal notification. So like, let's say you are a hospital organization, like a medical organization, and some PHI, personal health information, was breached in this incident. You will have to let the government know and the individuals know that their data was uh, was stolen. So you need to create a report that will actually be sent to like you know the commissioner. I forgot there's actually a commissioner in Canada, I believe, that has to review certain reports. And then finally, there's actually one of the terms mentioned in the previous presentation: post mortem. Is the uh, can we do better? So like, lessons learned. You need to talk about what worked and what didn't. You know, you want the processes you have and the procedures you have are not perfect. It's an evolving process. You need to adapt based on new experiences. You need to learn from what works, what doesn't work. Maybe it'll work. Oh, we didn't have break glass accounts, but now I think we should just we have a reason to believe we should have them because it was hard for us to respond in time. And then finally, bring in help. So when you want to bring something like you know nanny, you know legal counsel involved. So there could be legal requirements. You know, for example, a requirement by an organization to source your investigation for best practice. Like your internal best, your internal report would be less reputable than an external report that's been by like a consulting agency. You may also have like very specific lack of resources problems. Like for example, capacity where your existing teams have prior obligations. Like they already had 100% before the incident, but now they have to do their existing obligations on top of responding to the incident. So in that case, it would make sense to hire a consulting company to you know, augment your capabilities. And then there is capabilities. Like for example, you're a small company and nobody in your team has any IR experience. So you have no one who can actually do IR even if you have the all the time in the world to do it. So you need to hire someone to do it for you. And then there's also the consideration of advanced threats, APTs, advanced persistent threats, nation state actors, ransomware. When you're in that kind of state where it feels like it's all crashing down, I think that's also a really good point to uh, bring in some external help. Now in this section, we're gonna be talking about the external response process, like how companies such as Nanny would be involved in this. So. We're going to talk about how we scope the incident, the statement of work, which outlines the expectations for both parties, how the engagement, like the time to respond to the incident, and post-incident, which is you know complaining the work outlined in the statement of work and gathering data. So first, we're going to scoping call. If you are a part of a scoping call, this is the information you need to bring. You need to bring the number of systems in your environment, you know, number of servers, number of workstations, you know what. Technol the network topology, do you have like a DMZ? Do you have separate networks like a operational technology network versus a IT network? Do you have any cloud presence? Like do you use Office 365? Do you use any technologies? Like maybe use a, you know, CloudStrike, you know, Carbon Black, whatever other technolo technology you use. You need to know about that. And what our objectives will do is basically determine if we are capable of assisting. There's actually some instances where we actually have to turn down work either because we are we have too much work or we don't have anyone we, this is such a niche case that we have no one to do it for example we've been asked to like do e-discovery but we're not specializing in discovery so we actually pass it off to we refer them to consulting firms that specialize in e-discovery we also need to approximate the number of hours needed to complete the engagement so by knowing the number of systems and approximating how much detail analysis is needed we can create a budget and we need to prepare any technology needed for its engagement. This goes back to technology used. Can we use our own technology or do we have to use the, utilize the existing technology for our investigation? Maybe the client will be apprehensive about using our technology on top of their existing technology for whatever reason. So in the statement of work, we're using the notes from the scoping call. This is how we're gonna determine the budget. We don't want the budget to go too low because we risk going over budget and that requires an addendum where we basically say like, yeah, we're out of money. If you want us to continue working, we need more to sign an addendum to our contract saying we need more money. And that could be just, it was because the contract was poorly scoped or it took longer than expected due to unforeseen circumstances. We also want to outline expectations. For example, our consultants like myself should be focusing on providing interim response and analysis and not rebuilding. I would not be responsible for you know, reinstalling Windows Server, building their domain. That would be a responsibility for, let's say, our security transformation services team at Tandian. And that way we can outline additional services such as them. 
And if we're working for a legal firm, we often do three-way contract, which grants us attorney-client privilege. So let's go into the next slide, legal. Insurance. Cyber insurance is very common for many organizations, but they need to be involved in if external support is needed for the incident. Because like, if you want to use your insurance, you need to contact them so you can get the payout. Breach coaches are also an alternative, which is essentially like, let's say you've been by uh, like someone, your data has been stolen. Your breach coach can, is very much like a lawyer in the sense that they are specialized in this, in the proper ways of notifying and dealing with have the best practices for your organization when this stuff. External legal can also be involved as well. So the insurance and breach coaches may also refer a lawyer to be advised, to advise the client what's best for their legal situation. We can be involved with legal by way of a three-way contract where we work for the firm. So essentially, the, it's basically a, a arrangement between the attorney and the client, and we work for the attorney. And thus, since there's attorney-client privilege and we work on behalf of the attorney, we also get attorney-client privilege. The benefit of attorney-client privilege is that it allows the information discussed between an attorney and client to be privileged, which means that it's not available during legal discovery. And this is important. It's like saying, like, you know, if I was talking, if I was like, if I was a criminal and I was talking to my lawyer about something illegal I did, I don't want anything in my private conversations with my lawyer to be used as evidence against me. And now let's talk about the actual process when engagement begins. First, we do the deployment or enrollment of technology. We used to be, so many used to be named FireEye, but and we used the Trellis agent. But since we've rebranded as Mainnet and have been moving and uh, transitioning to Google, we've decided to become more of a platform agnostic company. So we have developed capabilities to use other platforms. But we do prefer to use our Trellis agent since we've been having a lot of experience with it. Next, we do IOC sweeps, indicator of compromise sweeps. So we have known bad, so immediate IOC is discovered in the incident, such as from an alert or preliminary investigation. So let's say you have an internal report, that the internal report that was done. We take a look through those, and we have their initial ones. We have the alerts from the initial incident that get triggered. We have our you know, starting point. Next, we have behavioral. So this is activity that's considered suspicious, but is not attributed to a specific malware or threat actor. This could be something like seeing Base64 PowerShell in the event logs, or data staging in unusual directories or unusual service names, like maybe they all like gibberish looking service names. And signature, which is IOCs that are associated with malware or, or threat actor, such as the file name, the service name used, the commands used, or the names of the folders created. For example, you know, lock, locky ransomware would append files with the dot locky extension after they encrypted them. And then once we identify systems that have been hit, we do detailed systems analysis. So this is what we're doing. And we're analyzing the system in detail to determine what's fully happened to that system. So we're like, once we have, we plot out the information that we see on that system. And what we're doing is we're also doing timeline analysis. We're looking between the timestamps of instance. We're trying to look for any additional indicators of compromise that may be discovered during our investigation. And this is where it becomes an iterative process. So as we start from the top, we sweep on IOCs, no bad behavioral signature, we discover new systems, we perform detailed analysis, and that allows us to discover new IOCs that we create, and we sweep on them. And we keep repeating the process until nothing new is discovered. And then we do status updates. This is where we meet with the client to inform them of new findings and confirm apps. So sometimes we could be like, hey, you didn't give us access to your email service so we could do email investigation, or we're still looking for firewall logs that you provided, or maybe they're asking us for something like, hey, can you provide us with a presentation for our, our CEO? So this is where we can just keep like a regular communication to make sure that you know the client feels you know feels attended to. And then finally we have the ongoing and post investigation. So we have fulfillment. So as outlined in the previous slide, we have the statement of work, and that outlines what the deliverables are and the services are. And this is the fun part. I'm saying that sarcastically because this is where all the paperwork goes, in, where you have to do all the due diligence. So for example, in the investigative report, we have to you know, verify, validate it, um, get it peer reviewed. And then we also offer remediation hardening. So like I said, the incident response practice doesn't do the remediation or hardening, but we have different teams at many like advanced practices and security transformation services that advise and assist organizations to remediate and harden their environment after an incident. So advanced practices collection, 
Manny collects IOCs and malware from active engagements and uh, uses them to fuel their threat intelligence business. That actually makes Manny one of their better, like one of the better uh, threat intelligence services out there because we actually use information from active engagements. So we have information that a lot of other threat intel services do not have because we have that advantage of working in the front lines. And then finally, there is post engagement review. We offer a survey. We want to make sure all of our clients are satisfied. And then we also do a postmortem or lessons learned because both for the client and us, because we want to learn from any challenges we encounter in the investigation, but continue to be the best incident response company ever. And that's it for my presentation. Uh, I will close the presentation for now and I'll answer any questions in the stream questions chat. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, what kind of skills should somebody kind of build up if they are interested in, in getting into this field? Uh, you definitely need to start working on knowing your forensic artifacts. We use a lot of uh, Windows. We do a lot of analysis on Windows systems. This is the primary operating system for most environments, but also Linux servers as well. Part of the interview process when I was going on Manid was basically understanding, you know, Steganography, like if you ever use CyberChef to decode text, that was one of the challenges. It was also like you had to be able to understand what the difference between the different artifacts are and their significance and also their uh, nuances. So researching the different uh, forensic artifacts that are available on Windows and Linux systems, I think is a good start because it will get you in the right direction. Do you know of any uh, good resources online that... Uh you can use to uh, get better at these skills? Um, this, is, this is essentially where you want to go to like threat intelligence services or rather like any public information depots because they will provide those IOCs and such. But for example, I, there could, there is a, I don't have a specific website. We have internal resources for, that we, we reference at Mandiant, but there are some there's there's going to be some online resources which kind of outline the the main resources that are currently used and there's new ones being discovered every iteration of windows uh we could talk about this i can send you a link once i after the stream if you want to find something to look at yeah that'd be appreciated hey you have a question so how would one prepare for like the interviews like uh for these interview questions, as you stated earlier. So again, that this, this kind of goes. With, so, the first position I got in instant response, I did not have any much. I did not have much questions about. It, but if you've done like internal response for an organization, like you've worked at a SOC, you eventually get to learn these different artifacts. You'd be like, oh, the registry chain, the registry key was created, which is associated with this ransomware. So you eventually learn that okay, registry is a type of artifact, or you might see like. Oh, Amcash was an artifact that's used. It's basically you learn you can learn on the job by doing the job. Like if you work as like at a SOC, but the advanced techniques like you could do a course. I didn't take I did my course while I was at Manny, but like the course can give you detailed information of like the very typical information used. There's like some nuances between them. Okay, thanks a lot. If anybody else has any questions for Matthew, feel free to throw them in stream questions or hop on mic if you want to. Um, Matthew, uh, was there any sort of are there any sort of maybe like misconceptions or something a lot of people don't know about incident response that you feel they should know before they try to get into this field? Um, so what I've described, like working into response, it's not for everyone. It's still in the consulting. Uh, I'll answer that question after. Uh, it's it's very much a consulting field job. So like you basically have to work outside of. Sometimes you have to work outside of the hours. So if you don't like that kind of work, you either have to choose internal, 
but even then you might have to do like shift work if you work in internal uh, security or internal incident response. But there's also like the other stuff that I personally don't like, which is doing report writing because it's, I find it's pretty boring. The most exciting part for me when working in response is discovering a new thing. I like using the analogy of a bomb sniffing dog for my like like enjoyment of the position. We gotta keep finding like new and exciting things because eventually, if we keep finding like nothing boring or keep finding boring things, it eventually discourages them. To do with bomb sniffing dogs, you eventually have to plant like a fake bomb to get the dog more excited again. Thank you. I learned more about incident response and bomb sniffing dogs. Did not know that. Uh, hey, me. Matthew. Hey. Hey, I have another question. So I I know that you have a certificate in uh, GIAC, right? Uh, yes. So I'm curious, like, when did when 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 would you go for this certificate? Like, would it be after you graduate, or uh, would it be best to work for a bit gain some experience like one or two years and then go for your certificate for ngiec i would recommend that you go get your giec or gcfa rather once you've been working in the industry for a little bit they don't expect associates or junior positions to have this degree as a hiring requirement in fact some of the of the like for example manny we're looking for the actual raw talent not your credentials but um me personally, I, I, my just my reason for getting the certification was to improve my reliability of my knowledge and also, you know, using it as as credentials. Because for example, if I wanted to be like expert witness for, uh, for a court, then I wouldn't want to have credentials to, you know, back up my statements. So to answer your question, I would recommend getting it, like a year or two into it, because then, like for example, a GCFA was very expensive. If you're curious, like how much it cost in Canadian dollars, it was about. Ten thousand dollars, and I'm thankful that the company was able to uh, to subsidize it for me. Oh wow, <laughs> that's pretty crazy! Wow, insane. Uh, so in terms of certification, like, what would you recommend getting uh, first? Like, uh, if you want to get into this field, because I was thinking of maybe like looking into this as well myself, but uh, as like a beginner kind of certification, like, what should I uh, go for? Yeah, it's tough. Um, I, I will have to answer that question at a later point because I, I don't have the answer to that off the top of my head. Okay, yeah, no worries. Uh, hey, Matthew. How you doing? Hey. Um, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned participating in war rooms. What's, what's it like in a war room? Um, how are they conducted? Uh, I, you, we mentioned a little bit about you know who's involved in that, but I'd like to find out a little bit more about that. Sure. So, I've been on war rooms both as a consultant and as an in, internal incident response. And basically, in a war room, is just a bridge line, just a phone call where everyone from a different representation of everyone who's involved in like the different teams who are involved are on the line. Essentially, it just makes immediate communication of different discoveries more immediate. So, like. Instead of me like saying, oh, I found this alert that got shot off, instead of sending an email, I could talk to the people right away on the phone call and get more immediate response. Or, like, again, with the, the problem with uh, least privilege, I can talk with the network guy and be like, hey, can you check out this IP address for me and tell me what, who it belongs to? Like, I want to know which IP address this, per this, uh, this, or which account this IP belongs to. So that's, like, the, the kind of benefit you get from being on a warm is just that immediate response. Cool, thank you. Hey there, I got a question for you, if you don't mind. No problem. Um, so I was just um, curious if um, you've done any um, cloud forensics before, and if you have, is there any difference between, I guess, like the traditional kind of like um, forensics on a computer versus, let's say, in a cloud environment? Yes. Uh, so, so to, to, yeah, I do have experience working in cloud environments like Amazon, Google Cloud. Um, yeah, those are the two main ones, but like there's also other cloud services like Office 365. And the main difference I would have between like on premise and cloud is that we don't ha we have the only data we have is accessed by the by the cloud provider. So we only have access to logs and their retention based off what their retention policy is. 
like as an organization you can't have like one year retention policy you have to either buy it or go with a different provider so you have like that that first limitation second they may even have like proprietary uh documentation that they can't share with you which which outlines all the different deals and stuff like that so there could be this could lead to a lot of uh interpretation of the cloud logs while the in the direct logs are more uh, clear cut. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, I think any more questions, but um if you guys have any questions about, you know, working at Mandiant or interested about answer response, you can DM me at Geek to Hooping, and I can answer any of your questions there. Um, for those people, which I said I, for those people, uh, I promised I would answer the, the question at a later point. Uh, please DM me to remind me. I might forget. I'll try to answer your question very soon. Thank you, Matthew, uh, for coming out, doing a talk for us. And thank you, everybody else who came to attend this last summer session. Uh, our next session is scheduled for September 15th. And in case you missed the earlier announcement, it's going to be on campus with an online option if you are unable to make it. So hope to see some of you guys there. Uh, until then, take it easy.